Hello and welcome back. Welcome to Chapter 7, uh, Internal Controls and Cache. Before we jump into Chapter 7, a few housekeeping notes. Number one, if you are missing any kind of work, it must be submitted as soon as humanly possible. The reason being is because we are approaching the halfway through the semester mark. The university has asked that I provide them with a status update of all students. What that means is I will provide them with a satisfactory or unsatisfactory mark. That depends on your progress in this course. If you are missing work and are currently at a non-pass rate, then I'll have to mark you as unsatisfactory. I don't want to do that because it does not work out too well. <laughs> so please, if you're missing any kind of work, that, that could be chap the chapter six homework that we just finished, or that could be, you know, maybe it's uh, chapter four discussion, whatever, let's get it in. Because uh, otherwise I have to tell the university about your progress and, you know, it has to be either satisfactory or unsatisfactory. And I really don't want to have to mark you as unsatisfactory. That's why I want you to get up your work caught up. And if you could do that by the 22nd, which is this Thursday, that would be ideal. Because on the 22nd, I have to report to the university. So that's just a quick housekeeping note. Uh, another housekeeping note, we are now in week seven. Uh, at the, the end of next week, end of ne so the end of week eight, is when the midterm exam is. It's different from the midterm report. The midterm exam is the midterm exam. The midterm progress is it, the midterm progress is for me to tell the university about your progress. Midterm exam is at the end of week eight. That's the end of next week. So that so we really have to get the momentum going. Yes. So those are just my two quick housekeeping items. Um, and so let's go ahead and get started on uh, Chapter 7. Okay, Chapter 7, Internal Controls and Cache. Now, the reason why we have internal controls, as you might imagine, is because there have been in the past some fraudulent activities that have happened that uh, have made the news, so to speak. Uh, one of the reasons why a system of internal controls was originally established was because of a series of fraudulent companies or companies that have made fraudulent transactions in the past. A great example of that is a company called Enron, uh, which was a energy company back in the late 90s, early 2000s. They came into the news because they were overstating their sales, and their their sales was uh, being overstated, and so the government created a um, series of laws that are applicable to companies that are publicly traded to protect investors from companies like Enron, Health South. Um, uh, Bell Company, there's a number of companies that have defrauded investors by overstating their sales, understating their expenses, you know, making the company look a lot better than it actually is. So that's against the law. You can, you're not supposed to be doing that. So especially if you're a publicly traded company. Publicly traded companies, as you know, uh, individual investors like myself will, would buy stock based off of the company's performance. And so the, the U.S. government created this, what they call a Sarbanes-Oxley Act. This was uh, created in 2002, and it applies to publicly traded companies on public exchanges. The idea behind this act is to provide confidence within the public to trust that the financial reports generated by publicly traded companies is true, accurate, and transparent. The way that that happens is that the... Uh, the public companies get audited by uh, publicly traded accounting for, uh, public accounting firms to ver verify that their financial statements are true and accurate and transparent. 
The idea behind Sarbanes-Oxley was to create a system of internal control, that, which are processes and procedures that companies use to safeguard their assets, make sure that their information is true, transparent, and accurate, and also to ensure that the company is complying with uh, laws and regulations at the federal and state levels. So Sarbanes-Oxley uh, is used to make sure that the publicly traded companies are complying with these internal controls and rules and regulations and laws. So here's a nice little graphic representing this. So prior to Sarbanes-Oxley, companies were com committing fraud and theft and investors were, were losing money and stockholders were losing money and creditors were losing money because companies were either purposely trying to defraud them or they just simply had a system of weak internal controls. So the federal government, uh, in their infinite wisdom, tried to help companies to become better by establishing the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, which forced companies to act uh, with better behavior, to reduce fraud and theft uh, by having a system of internal controls to protect investors, creditors, and stockholders. So the, this law also required companies uh, and their third-party uh, accounting companies to report the effectiveness of the company's internal controls. So what this basically said is, uh, let's say I'm uh, Deloitte or I am uh, you know, KPMG or one of the other large accounting firms, and I audit uh, your company that's publicly traded, and I'll say, yes, they have very strong internal control processes, here's what they are, so forth and so on. I'm basically validating what you have is is strong, right? And so uh, every year, publicly traded companies are required to file what's called a 10K report on the Securities Exchange Commission website. And you, as a potential investor, can go and do some research on the sec.gov website and review the company's 10K report. The 10K report is, uh, is a public filing of the income statement, balance sheet, statement of cash flows, as well as a, a manager's discussion. And it provides a, a true picture of the company's operations within that year. And I personally re do look at these 10K reports uh, before I make any investment decisions. So the objective of internal controls are to provide uh, investors assurance that the company is protecting their assets through safeguard processes and procedures. The information is accurate and transparent and that employees and managers are complying with local laws and regulations. So again, this is kind of a nice picture of what inter what why do we have internal controls? We've well, got to protect our assets. Assets include, of course, cash, accounts receivable, inventory, and then, of course, your property, plant, and equipment. We, we, we need to make sure we protect all of those great things. And so... Uh, that's one of the objectives of internal controls. Second one is make sure that your financial statements are accurate and transparent. And of course, the third is to make sure that there's compliance with laws and regulations at the federal and the state levels. So again, one of the reasons why Sarbanes-Oxley was created was because there was a series of frauds being perpetrated by companies. Uh, fraud is a very serious problem. It occurs every single day here in the United States and around the world. The act of fraud is to deceive uh, some, uh, someone for personal gain. So employee fraud is another uh, aspect of fraud where the, uh, the employee acts to deceive the employer for personal gain. Uh, an example of employee fraud is uh, I clocked in 20 minutes early, I did nothing, and then I left on time or late. Uh, in effect, you stole 20 minutes from your employer of pay, right? 
another act of employee fraud is uh, I'm a bartender. I, I, uh, a customer paid with cash. I didn't, I ring it up as a no sale in the uh, register. And then I uh, pocketed the, the, the sale and gave the customer a change. That's fraud. It's also theft. So, so there, there's kind of several, uh, several examples of fraud from an employee's perspective. So in order per, to prevent such fraud from happening, companies establish a, a elements of internal control. And these elements help to prevent fraud. Uh, the elements are to control the environment. Uh, to control the environment means I put up security cameras, I provide uh, a checks and balances for my employees, I make sure everyone's safe, that's a control environment. Second one is risk assessment. Risk assessment is where I look at my business operations and ident I identify poten potential risk. That could be risk of theft from customers or employees. I could have a risk of a uh, pandemic. I can have a risk of my building burning down. I could have a risk of robbery. I can have a risk of competitors coming into my space that are better than me. There's a lot of different types of risk, but uh, to have good internal controls, we need to constantly assess our risk. Control procedures. Control procedures is an element of internal control where I have a system in place to prevent theft. What do I mean? Control procedure. I, I have one person who receives the cash, a second person who counts the cash, and a third person who deposits the cash. That's a control procedure for cash. Uh, another control procedure might be I have two people signing off uh, on the work that was performed. That's a control procedure. Uh, I have a, one person who counts the drawer and a second person who makes the deposit. That's control procedure. Monitoring. Monitoring is not just security cameras. It is also documentation of perf employee performance, documentation of what's being sold, documentation of what's being purchased. That's monitoring. You're observing what is the transactions going into and out of the business. And the last one is information and communication. Having control over the information flow within the business helps us to identify who is in command of that information. I tell my customers certain things that I don't tell my employees. I tell my employees certain things I don't tell my customers. That's a control of information and communication. And of course, as you know, there are threats to the business. And there are th uh, control threats to the business. By implementing our, contr our uh, control elements, I am protecting my business. I am protecting my, my people. And I am also protecting the information and communication that is transferred between the user and the receiver. Controlling the environment. Again, this is where management and employees can uh, control the overall environment of the business. That could be things like the attitude of management. That could be things like uh, how your customers and employees behave. These are all aspects of the environment. There are three factors to controlling the environment. One is what is management's operating style? Uh, what is their philosophy? And how does that relate to what the managers are saying to their stakeholders? Another one is a company's organizational structure. As you know, and you probably learned this in your uh, intro to business course, 
organizational structure is how the business is composed. At the top, you usually have a CEO or a COO or a, you know, uh, some other officer level. Then below that, you have other officers or managers of the company. Then below that, you have your employees. That's, that's called an organizational structure. So the structure is a part, part of the control process, how information goes up and down the ladder, right? Uh, th another one is companies' personnel policies. These would include policies around hiring, training, evaluating, compensating, and promoting employees. Uh, other policies include things like job descriptions, code of ethics, conflict of interest, per and other personnel policies. And I'm sure we've all encountered that at some point on the job. So again, uh, the control environment. So, so how does it look? The CEO dictates the organizational structure. Organiz organizational structure is made up of employees. Uh, the employees develop the personnel policies, which then influence management's philosophy and org operating style. So talk a little bit about risk assessment. Again, this is where the business looks at uh, changes, you know, risks. What is risk? There's a lot of risk that, that may impact the business, and the idea is that the business needs to mitigate or lessen the possibility of those risks. Risks include things like changes in customer requirements, new competitors, uh, regular, regulatory changes. That includes like changes to laws and re regulations, right? And then you also have changes in economic conditions. Management should constantly look at these types of risks that are being posed to the business and then figure out ways to assess those risks and mitigate those risks from happening. Control procedures are used to provide reasonable assurance that the business goals will be achieved, including the prevention of, of fraud. Control procedures include things like making sure your employees are responsible, rotating their duties, uh, making sure they, they take vacation when they're supposed to take vacation. <laughs> That's something I'm terrible about myself, I promise. Uh, per procedures are, and policies are in place for personnel. Second one is separating responsibilities for, for, for related operations. The example I gave here was I have one person counting the cash and one person depositing the cash. That's a separation of responsibilities for the operation. It's kind of like a checks and balances, right? That's what you want to think about that. Separating the operations, uh, custody of assets, and accounting. In, a, in the accounting operation of most businesses, there are usually separate people doing some similar tasks. Like, for example, in a larger business, I would, like, when I was managing at, at the hotel, the way it worked for me was I had one person that was responsible for accounts receivable, one person that was responsible for accounts payable, and a third person that was responsible for payroll. That, by separating the, the accounting operation like that, it creates a system of checks and balances. And, it, and of course, uh, you know, you want to make sure that you safeguard your assets, including how cash is handled. This is a nice graphic representation of that. What about monitoring? So monitoring within the internal con uh, control process helps us to evaluate weakness and, and areas to improve control. So for example, if I monitor my employees closely, and I identify changes in their behavior, it might indicate a problem. It's, I, I, and I, I do the same thing with my students. I do the same thing with uh, my coworkers. You can identify when someone's behavior changes simply by the way that they talk to you, if the way that they talk to you changes, or the way that they interact with you changes. Something's up. 
okay? And, and it, it could just be a bad day. Sure, we all have bad days. I have bad days. Today was a bad day. But the, the, the point here that I'm trying to make is by monitoring your people and your, and, and your assets, when you identify changes, it will help us to improve our internal controls by identifying those weaknesses. So that's the concept of monitoring. Oh, warning signs. Warning signs with people, again, th there's an abrupt change. You know, something happened to them where all of a sudden they changed, right? And that happens, absolutely. Uh, close social re relationships with re suppliers. This is an interesting one. An example of that is you work for a grocery store that sells liquor. You became real friendly with the person selling the liquor to the grocery store. And all of a sudden, there's a couple of cases in your trunk that should be in the grocery store, right? That's, that's a change in relationship. Uh, refusing to take a vacation. Uh, that's always interesting. You know, um, that's, a that's a warning sign for people. Because if they don't take vacation, they get burned out. Right, and we want to prevent burnout. Frequent borrowing from other employees, drug and alcohol use. These are all warning signs for people. Warning signs for accounting systems, a little bit different but similar because they're still behavioral. Missing documentation, uh, missing transaction numbers, unusual increase in customer refunds. Like for when I was working in retail, uh, a manager would say, oh, you have too many voided transactions or, oh, you have too many refunds. That's a warning sign in the accounting system. It says, oh, hey, you know, so, something's a little weird here. The cash store keeps opening, but, you know, because transactions are being voided. That's interesting. It's a warning sign. Differences between cash receipts and what's actually in the bank. Sudden increase in slow payments, a backlog in recording transactions. These are all warning signs for the accounting system that there's a potential problem. So what do we need to know about information and communication? By identifying how we report information helps us to establish guidelines and control procedures. For example, according to the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, I am required to have my financial statements audited by external accounting companies. Okay? Um, that is a process, that is a procedure. Uh, and it helps me to become compliant with reporting for legal and regulatory reasons. Management also uses external information to assess the environment and conditions that impact their decision-making and external reporting. What are the limitations of having internal controls? Well, there's the human element. That's always a limitation. Humans are humans, right? They make mistakes. We all make mistakes at some point in our life. Some can be real small, some can be real big. We all make mistakes, and that's okay. It's all right to make mistakes, it's, but we, we need to make understand that humans make mistakes. And, you know, if you accidentally hit another zero in the accounting system, it can really do some damage to the company. So, Having a system of internal controls can help to prevent those types of human mistakes. Uh, another thing is a cost-benefit analysis. This is where we say, is it too costly to have this system of internal controls versus not having it? And then, of course, what is, what is that cost-benefit? Okay. So still on the topic of internal controls, one of the other important things we need to talk about is cash. Cash, as you know, is very liquid. Cash is coins, currency, checks, money, orders, anything paper. That also includes things like 
credit cards. That's all cash, right? It's cash for the business anyway. Those types of things uh, are very prone to be stolen or improperly used. Cash with, uh, on deposit with banks or the financial institutions are made of, also available for withdrawal are also considered cash. Cash is very prone to be improperly used or stolen or misappropriated or whatever. An example of this happening, uh, using a petty cash fund to treat a customer out to a state dinner. That's not good use of cash. Okay, that's improper use of cash. Uh, believe me, I've seen it happen. So to protect uh, theft or misuse of cash, the business is establishes a system of controls for cash. For example, looking at the time it's, it's received until the time that it's been deposited at the bank. That's one example of a control system for cash. Another would be the use of receipts in your petty cash drawer. That's a control system for cash. Businesses normally receive cash from their customers who are paying for products or customers who are making payments on their accounts. Okay. Professor, I have a question. Yes, Angela. Um, at one of my previous jobs, I used to be in charge of the the P card and like yeah. the petty cash um, box. Okay. So when my company used to go out for lunchings and things like that, they would have to bring me back the receipts, right? Correct. But I noticed on a couple of the receipts that it was altered, right? Because, okay. <laughs> so my, my question to you is, <laughs> it's kind of funny. Um, the reason why it was altered because they, the some of the employees end up having drinks. Yep, that's usually and, the, that's usually the case with P cards. Yep. Yes, sir. And they were not supposed to have been drinking using the P card. So, of course. but me staying at the office waiting for them to bring back the receipt so I can, you know, do what I need to do. I noticed that the receipt was altered. So in cases like that, right, I mean, yeah. I, I took, I had to take some necessary steps, whatever, but. Of course. They altered the, the, the receipt and it made me feel funny to the point where, um, I didn't want to be in charge of the, the, the P card anymore sure. anything, because it's like someone wanted me to actually do some fraudulent things and I did not want to, I, I was uncomfortable. So with that, is that considered to be, um, that's fraud, right? Absolutely. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. It, it's, it's misappropriation of funds. So it's definitely fraud. Um, so, so for example, it, in DC government, which, you know, I'm obviously an employee of D.C. government working at UDC. I, uh, at, the, at UDC, uh, when, I, when I was running the uh, hospitality program for WDLL, I had a P-card. And, um, you know, I went through training and all that. And they, they told, you know, I, I learned right from wrong, how to use it, how not to use it, what to use it for, what not to use it for, all that good stuff. Um. And I've heard of things like that happening. You know, it's it's uh, it's unfortunate. It, you know, and that happens in, in other businesses too, whether it's government or not. Um, you know, and and yeah, it's fraud. You know, so so like you you're saying, oh, I I, I took so and so to dinner. Another thing, what that will do too, Angela, and this is something to watch for, is and what I've seen I've seen people do this. Instead of bringing you the itemized receipt, they'll bring you the signature copy that there are no items on it. And that's and yes, sir. I experienced that too. And then another thing that they did, and and I didn't really notice until when we when my company got audited, and they had to uh, the the you know, the young lady came from corporate, and she came to talk to me because I was handling some of sure. the financial and she looked at the receipt and she noticed that, that it was altered and she asked me questions and I began to tell her I'm just the person that just received <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, you know but but what but, happened was it mm -hmm. causes me to 
like speak up and tell the truth and it put me in a compromising position and i didn't like of course it. no and that, and that's and that's the thing and, and and you know you have to have that conversation with yourself is you know how far to push your own values right and and so and so and i've i've had to face that myself and i've had to fire friends you know i've had to fire people close to me i i've had to you know, really put myself out there uh, to do the right thing, right? And sometimes doing the right thing is a difficult thing. You know, it's, it's difficult to make that type of decision. Um, and, you know, that's that's one of the things with management is you will be faced with these types of things, just like Angela was. Uh, you, you really need to think about your value system, how you would react, um, you know, what is ethical, what is right, what is just, and you live by those systems, right? You live by those beliefs. And I've had to do the same thing. And 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 I and to your point, Angela, I see that type of thing happen a lot. Um I've had I've had myself on the line for stuff ridic ridiculous things that other people have done. And you know, you really need to think about, okay, well, how do I approach this, right? Uh, from a legal and, and, and ethical position. And, and so, yeah, I can see why it made you uncomfortable, um, you know, being in that position and being responsible with those P cards and, and enter the transactions. And, you know, yeah, I, I'd be uncomfortable too. And I, and I have that. So I, yes, I, sir. I can totally relate. I, and also, um, when my manager would come back after going to lunchings and things, and, and it causes me to like, um, ask for the, the receipt over and over again. And it was like, I had to chase down the receipt to get it back. With the oh, yeah. It was awful. It was oh, yeah. awful. I, I know it all too well. I've been there, done that. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not fun. Uh, you know, and it's funny because, uh, at the hotel, oftentimes I'd have to go to the general manager's office and be like, Hey, uh, I need your receipts from last week. And it, you'd be like, oh, I lost them. I'm like, well, you need to unlose them. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's, right. It's like you're telling your boss to unlose a receipt. You know, it's, it's, it's not like you're putting yourself out there. So it's like, you know, it, and it makes you feel uncomfortable. It makes your boss feel uncomfortable because you're going to your boss and saying, hey, I need your receipts. It's like, you know, I'm not going to judge you what's on here. I'm just going to do my job and put them in there. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so yeah, I, I hear you. But yeah, you, you, I've seen, I've seen, uh, I've seen everything under the sun pretty much. <laughs> the answer to your question is there, um, <clears throat> again, it really goes back to your value system, you know, and what you're comfortable with. Um, Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Good question. And thanks for bringing that up. That's that, that interesting. Interesting stories. <laughs> okay, so what about cash received from sales? Uh, it's very important that you protect the register at all costs. <laughs> uh, you know, when it comes to over the counter tra cash transactions. So, what happens with the register? Customer makes the purchases, the register records the transaction. The register produces receipts. The receipts get to the, sent to the accounting department. This, uh, this picture is obviously very old because now it's, everything's electronic. Um, but still at the end of the night, and, and most places, you print out the register at the end of the night, you give it to the accounting department, accounting department enters everything in. Uh, cash comes out of the register, goes into the safe, um, then it goes to the bank. The, the bank tickets are recorded, given to the accounting department. The accounting department makes journal entries. This is kind of like the process of how cash transactions work. This example is obviously a grocery store of sorts, um, but it works the same way pretty much at every retailer. Uh, oh my goodness, what about this? And I've seen this a thousand times too. Uh, over, under. <laughs> Salespeople make errors. Uh, yeah, of course. So a cashier makes errors. We all make errors. As a result, the amount of the cash on hand may be different from the uh, sales uh, cash amounts. In this case, we record what's called a cash short and over. Here's an example. 
Uh, cash register total for May 3rd was $35,690. At, uh, however, at the end of the night, we, we totaled everything up and it ended up being $35,668. Uh-oh. <laughs> cash sales and receipt shortage over under. So we debited our cash, the actual cash we have, which is $35,668. And we debit this account called cash short and over, $22, to equal our sales that we rang up for the day of $35,690. So regardless of whether the cash is over or under, we debit the cash short and over account to reflect that difference. This is how we reconcile it. Now, of course, somebody's probably going to get in trouble for the $22 that's missing. But but, the, but we still need to account for it being missing. The opposite would be true if the cash was over. If we're over, it would be credited. That's kind of what this beautiful slide tells us. A lot of words on that. Okay, what about cash received in the mail? <laughs> Please, for the love of God, don't put cash in the mail. <laughs> Bad idea. Very dangerous. You could do money orders. You could do checks, preferably checks, in the mail. Very, Be very careful when you do that. These days, everything is electronic. But if you're still writing out checks and mailing them out, which some of you might be, I, I'm not going to judge you because there's a few times I have to do that too. But be very careful. We know that the mail, there could be problems, yeah? Most companies design their invoices where customer returns the portion of the invoice called a remittance with their payment. So, for example, I just got a bill in the mail uh, for some, some dues that I have coming up. And so what I'll do is when I go to pay my check, there's this line that says, please detach and return the above portion with your payment. And it usually has the company's name and address on it, your name and address on it, a barcode, and the amount that's due. And then you put in the enclosed payment, you write your check, you put that in with your check. The idea behind that, you know, when you get the physical bill in the mail and it's got this detached portion and all that, that detached portion is called, uh, that's a way to control the cash that's received in the mail. So when the company receives my check, along with this little piece of paper, they're going to use that little piece of paper to control the check that they receive and they enter it into, the, into their system. It's a way of controlling it. Now, of course, most of us these days use what's called EFT, Electronic Funds Transfer. This is when we pay uh, electronically over the Internet we, uh, or over the phone or any other electronic means. Uh, in this case, it's basically just simply a debit and a credit, right? There's there's no there's no um, other method of control except what you'll notice is on the EFT. There's usually like a transaction number, and that transaction number follows that that electronic fund transfer. Most companies like to use EFT because it costs them less. They don't have to mail anything. Um, that, that there's a lower cost of processing. Uh, it's just easier, it's quicker, uh, and it reduces any type of errors. Of course, any time that we're dealing with um, any type of tr tr cash transaction, we need to make sure that there's assurance that payments are made for authorized transactions, and that cash is used effectively and efficiently. Yay. Okay, let's talk about another thing that I'm sure Angela and myself have probably run into at one time or another. This is called a voucher system. A voucher system is a set of procedures that authorizes and records liabilities such as cash payments that may be either manual or computerized. A voucher is a document that serves as a process of authority to pay cash or issue an electronic funds transfer. Um, okay, so let me tell you my story about vouchers. In the hotel business, 
Sometimes we have guests that will arrive to the hotel in a cab instead of the hotel shuttle, okay? In such cases, the hotel might pay the, the uh, guest cab fare, okay? So the way it works is that we use a voucher. We'll give the voucher um, to the or to the accounting department, and we'll give the cash to, to the cab driver out of the petty cash fund. The voucher then goes into the, the drawer for the end of the night. Another uh, situation is a guest comes into the hotel, and the hotel is running a special where the customer can get a drink at the bar or some food at the bar, if it's past hours, okay. In that case, the uh, we give the voucher to the to the guest. The guest gives the voucher to the restaurant to receive their their uh, food. Right. That's an example. Those are just examples of way vouchers have happened. Angela, do you have any examples of vouchers? The only voucher we used to um, deal with was like a clothing voucher. Um, we had like set companies, I mean, set um, department stores that we could send a voucher to one of our clients and they were able to go and get clothing that way. Perfect. Yep. Yeah. Good example. Yeah. And, and so the, the way you want to think of a voucher is they basically treat it like cash, except the difference is the company usually pays that voucher later to, to that respective uh, purchaser or supplier. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, yeah, so, You're welcome. Yeah, thank you. Yep. It, so it's it's computerized uh, in a computerized system. You know, when it comes to these types of vouchers, it's usually direct, directly entered into the computer system. Uh, there's usually a due date, checks, things like that. It's it kind of, it's very similar to the way it would be if you received an actual bill in the mail. Cash paid by EFT, which happens all the time. This an example of this would be an ATM withdrawal. Payments or wages uh, to an employer through direct deposit. Uh, payment to a supplier or vendor through direct deposit or direct uh, direct payment out through the website. These are all examples of EFT payments. Bank accounts, as you know, bank accounts are very strict. Uh, they use very strict control processes. Uh, bank accounts reduce the amount of cash on hand. The way that works is because I take my excess cash from the business, I deposit into the bank account, it reduces my cash on hand. Bank accounts provide independent recording of tr cash transactions through the bank statements. Bank statements are utilized to help me, the business, reconcile my account, my bank account. So we'll talk about that here in a second. Bank statement. Bank statement is usually mailed to me every month email, mail, whatever. They provide a list of the transactions that have happened in the bank account for that respective month. And then they also provide a beginning and ending balance, plus or minus any deductions, right? And you've, I'm sure, hopefully you've all seen bank statements before. It looks very similar to this. As the account number, the dates of uh, the range of transactions, the ending balance is at the top, uh, or the beginning balance at the top, deposits, withdrawals, other, and then your ending balance. Um, this is very typical. Uh, bank statement shows the transaction numbers, the amounts, all that good stuff. Now, I would take that bank statement and reconcile it. We'll talk about reconciling here in a second. The bank statement uh, provides an accounting for the tr uh, cash transactions. Uh, let me see. Because the bank statement's prepared from the bank's point of view, a credit memo entry from the bank statement indicates an increase to the company's account. We well, you know that. Anytime that there's a deposit of cash, it's a credit. It's a credit to your account. And as you know, a debit is a reduction in the company's cash. So the bank statement works the same way. Credits and debits with cash, 
Debit increases cash. Credit reduces cash. You know that already. The same exact thing applies to the bank account. When you're debiting, you're increasing your cash. When you're crediting, you're reducing your cash. Uh, the bank statement records EFTs, all that good stuff, right? Bank makes deposit entries through EFT service charges, customer checks refunded, or corrections. Okay, it's an example of the relationship between the company and the bank. Uh, the bank statement has various codes on it. The codes mean a few different things depending on the type of transaction. Okay, uh, sometimes there's over under. How do we figure that out? Through the process of bank reconciling. Let me show you bank reconciling. Very important, bank reconciling. Bank reconciliation is the analysis of items and amounts creating the difference between cash balances reported in the bank statement and the cash on the account of the ledger. Oh. In other words, I take what the bank sent me the piece of paper, the bank statement. I look at the bank statement and I compare that to the transactions I have on my general ledger in my accounting system, my QuickBooks, my whatever, right? And I reconcile it. I, uh, I look at the bank statement. Transaction happened on October 2nd for $100. Then I go to my ledger. Transaction, $100. Check. You check it off. And you do that. That's called reconciling. It's basically, at the end of that banking month, you want to make sure that the cash balance that you have on that bank statement matches the cash balance on your general ledger. The two should, should be in balance at the end of each month, or at least up to a certain point in time. The adjusted cash balance is determined by the bank reconciliation process and is reported on the balance sheet. As you know, cash is on the balance sheet. How does it work? Bank reconciliation bank section begins with the cash balance, the bank statement, and ends with the adjusted balance at the end. If the adjusted balance should match with what you have on your um, ledger account for cash. Adjusted uh, balance from the bank company's sections must be equal. So again, this is just a nice visual representation of what that looks like. Um, and of course, there are steps to preparing a bank reconciliation. First thing to do is enter the cash balances at the end, add deposits. Deduct any uh, checks that have not yet been paid, not yet been cashed by the bank. And then determine the adjusted balance by totaling adjustments, adding up, subtracting. And step five, enter the cash balance according to the company. If the end, this is the ending balance. Add any credit memos that have not yet been recorded. Then deduct any debit memos that have yet been recorded. And this will help you to determine the adjusted balance at the end. And then, of course, step nine is to make sure that everything balances. Fun stuff. <laughs> but very important. It's a very important process. Here's an example. Bank statement shows a balance of $3,359.78 as of July 31st. The cash balance... Uh, on on the company's books on that same date is two thousand five hundred forty nine 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 cents. Well, clearly something must have uh, happened here. A couple of checks were out, what we call outstanding. Outstanding means they haven't yet ca been cashed. Okay, outstanding check means it has not yet been cashed. So how do we figure out what the difference was? July thirty first. There was a deposit that we have has not yet been recorded by the bank because the statement was made on July 31st, right? So if I made a deposit on July 31st, the same time my statement was printed out, of course it's not going to show up on the bank statement. Then I had, I had outstanding checks. 
three of them to be precise. So you take your deposits minus the uh, outstanding checks to, of course, get to the difference. Then all, we also had a note receivable for $400 uh, plus $8 interest that was not yet collected by the bank. So we record a credit memo. Then we need to uh, have a check. For, we have a, also have a check from a customer that was returned by, by the bank for $300. So I need to issue a debit, a debit memo and, of course, any fees that might be incurred. So we do all of these things, all of these steps, to reconcile the process to make sure that our bank statement balance matches the balance on our ledger. It's very important that those two always match at, at a certain point in time. They don't have to always match every day. They just have to match at certain points in time, usually at the end of every single month. And that's usually when I do my bank reconciling is at the end of each month. The reason why I do that is because, number one, you want to make sure that you're always on top of your cash, okay? But the other reason is that it always makes sure this, that your balance is on your, for your cash balance on your balance sheet is correct. Of course, we make journal entries uh, for the reconciliation process by debiting cash, crediting notes receivable, interest revenue for that particular transaction that happened for this company. And then, of course, debit receivables, debit miscellaneous expense, debit accounts payable, credit cash. These are all uh, recon uh, these are adjusting entries that you might have to make. The, the similar types, they, they're not always going to be the same. But you, uh, the, the point that I'm trying to get across here is that you make adjusting entries to uh, get your cash and your balance sheet to balance with the cash that's in the bank. Angel, here's another fun one. Petty cash fund. <laughs> okay, so uh, petty cash. Sometimes it's not practical to pay small amounts for items like postage, office supplies, minor repairs. So we have a special fund called the Petty Cash Fund. Now, basically what this is, is a small amount of cash that we use for various small things. When I don't have the ability to quickly grab a checkbook or go to, go to the accounting department and ask them to write a check for something that's small. It's like saying... You know, at the hotel, if you had you had a situation where uh, a, a guest um, who was there for a wedding destroyed their tie, so you said, "Okay, no problem." You ran out to Macy's, you bought the guest a new tie for twenty bucks. You're probably not going to write a check from the hotel for twenty dollars for the guest. You're going to use it from the petty cash fund. Now, the point is. To replace that petty cash fund, you bring in the receipt for the use of that petty cash. And the receipt plus the cash need to balance to the original petty cash amount. Angela, any stories for petty cash? Um, no. I'll, oh. I'll need the store. Uh, well, we, we, we had like the P card, so we never really had like actual cash. Got you. Fair enough. Fair enough. But yeah, it's a, it's a similar process. So the petty cash funds established to re, to reduce uh, the amount of work that's needed to be for small transactions, like paying for a cost, uh, paying for a guest uh, cab fare, or paying for like a small expense. Oh, the front desk ran out of stamps. Go run. Go run to the post office. Get up some, some stamps. You know, small stuff. We we use petty cash for that. But the idea here is that you need to keep all of the receipts with the rest of that petty cash to ensure that the petty cash account balances. That way we can replenish it with that same balance. And to do that, we just simply write a check for uh, payable to petty cash. We cash it at the bank, put the cash back in. Petty cash uh, is debited, cash is credited to uh, to 
first establish the petty cash fund. Then, of course, you take all the receipts at the end and you debit the various expenses and credit cash, which will balance with your debited uh, cash amount for the um, petty cash fund. And then very, there's other rare type of transactions with using cash. One's called a special purpose fund. This is like very small special circumstances, like you're on travel, um, there's travel expenses, that type of stuff. Um, in, in Angel's case, it's a P card, so but it's but it, it usually comes out of what we call a special purpose fund uh, for the use of that P card. So when the P card gets gets swiped um, in the in in the airport for a bottle of water, or whatever goes under travel expense. Travel expense uh, is debited. We credit special purpose fund. Just an example. <clears throat> cash and cash equivalents. There are other things other than cash that are treated like cash. And these we call this cash and cash equivalents. Cash equivalents would include things like a U.S. Treasury bond, uh, a note by a major corporation, or money market funds. It's just like cash, but not quite cash. <laughs> so there's cash and cash equivalents. And then we have uh, compensating uh Compensating balance is another rare type of version of cash. Uh, compensating balance is often required uh, as a part for a loan agreement at, to, to act as a line of credit. A line of credit, as you know, also acts as cash. A few last slides here. We use cash to also make decisions uh, and to a couple of formulas that we use for making cash cash decisions is how much cash do we have on hand? Cash on hand. Uh, cash on hand. We we calculate what we call days of cash on hand. How much ca how much cash do I have on hand on average per day? To calculate that, we take our cash uh, plus our short term investments and we divide by daily cash operating expenses. Daily, daily cash operating expenses is computed by taking your operating expenses minus depreciation expense divided by 365. That gives you daily cash operating expenses. The idea behind calculating this um, is to kind of give us an idea of how much cash I'm, um, I, I have available to use per day. That's just kind of the idea behind it. And that is the end of chapter seven. Uh, yay! How about that? We 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 did pretty good here. Uh, that was about an, an hour. Or so, uh, so are there any comments, questions, concerns, and anything that you uh, thought we would should should talk about that we haven't? Anything at all? Or are we good? <laughs> Oh, I'm good, Professor. Thank you. Angela, good. Awesome. Thank you so much. And, and Angela, I really appreciate the stories. They, they help to provide context for, for uh, your classmates. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tony, Tony, are you okay? Is everything okay? Yes, no, maybe. Ms. Harris, Ms. Harris, are you okay? Is everything all right? Can you hear me, Professor? This is Robinson. Tony, Tony I can hear you. Oh yeah, I'm here. It just was—I had a hard time unmuting. That's okay. No worries. Um, I, I enjoyed the Angela stories as well. Um, <laughs> has the, the transportation company. So as far as like the petty cash and stuff like that. We had that, and they, it was accessible to the drivers, the um, the operators. Only um, if they had to go tow a car, and the, in order to get the car, they were selling the car for two hundred or so. Um, we would take two hundred in cash, or we'd be like a personal check from the um, our, my business account. 
like that. And then we, then I balance the books that way. Um, just have to get a receipt and have the, um, the customer sign off on it and put their initials and stuff like that. And sure. make sure everything is correct on it as far as like the VIN number and everything so that we can have it, you know, logged in because we scan it in and put it into a file so that we can have a, um, a hard copy and a, a copy on a computer. So I, I kind of work ways with that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yep. And that's that's cool. That's It, sound, it sounds like you have a really good control system for it. Um, so as long as you maintain consistency with that process, that's, that's probably a great way to, to control petty cash. Uh, and that's also a great way to control cash in a general sense. So yeah, it sounds like you got a great system. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate you sharing that with us. Okay, so Professor, I do have a question. Um, I, I remember um, when I was, you know how you, you make, um, you use your, your debit card and start spending and spending and spending. <laughs> well, that, that's what I was doing and I was not keeping a ledger of the money that I was spending. Yeah. And what I've noticed with certain merchants, they do not like deposit their cash. So my, my thinking process was if I go ahead and deb use this debit card today and, and you know, my money will be level the next day. But what I've noticed, I have re I was respending my money. Yep. And I didn't understand how could that be until someone explained to me, like, if I go to the gas station to pump gas in my car, well, they will only hold, um, take a dollar off my debit card. And then two days later, um, then they will go ahead and I guess, you know, process it, exactly. process it. Thank yep. you. But go ahead and process it. But during that time, I had already reused the money and I didn't understand why my account couldn't get um, uh, get an accurate reading from my account because I kept re I kept using the money. And then finally, <laughs> someone told me, are you keeping a ledger of what you spend? I, I mean, I kept it in my mind, I guess, but I never wrote it down <laughs> and, and, and until I actually wrote it down and, and was looking at it. Then I was able to understand and how to keep a, a better track of it. But I was reusing the same money. Like if I go to the gas station and, uh -huh. and yeah, spend $40. You get a lot then, of trouble doing that. Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know what? It never showed that it was being deducted, but only $1. So that's yep. how... You that's, know, and so sure, yeah, and that, that's, <laughs> yeah, I I hear you, and uh, and, and I, that's a really common common thing that uh, I think people need to be aware of, because what happens is that you go, you use your debit card, it's up to that vendor to close and process the transactions for that date. So, like for example, if if I caught a ride with Tony's company, and I used my debit card with Tony. And then she doesn't close her batch. We call it closing the batch out. If she doesn't close the batch out on her tr credit card transactions that day, it'll stay open on my end. And it'll stay open until Tony closes the batch out. So if she decides I'm not going to close my batches out for, for, you know, I'm only going to do it one day a week. Well, whoever her customers are that use the their uh, debit cards or their credit cards or whatever, it shows as being open on their end. So, so in other words, the transaction doesn't post to your account until the person or the company that you purchased from closes their batch out. Oh, wow. And that's what I had to learn because even when I start started to keep a ledger and I, I would constantly go back and forth between the accounts and my ledger and I noticed that it hasn't closed out yep. and I was getting frustrated and angry because I was, ready. <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I was ready to move forward to spend you know whatever I had to take care of but Correct. I had to wait until it cleared but I'm you know it, it, it's yep. a lesson learned because I was respending that same money and, and getting <laughs> fees and it was you? awful been, been there done that totally understand <laughs> so, good story. Okay, uh, are there any other comments, questions, or concerns before I call it a night? So I'm ready when you are. Um, this is Rody. 
Yes. Um, I was a cashier, so um, the the process we had was someone when I would close out my account, someone else would close would do my bank my bag for me, and I had to make sure that um, all my cash, my pennies, everything matched. And then um, sometimes we would not get that receipt until the next day. Correct. And and you you was on pins and needles because sometimes it was short. <laughs> and, and exactly. so, so you you had to learn how to be very careful. And when the um, the the dollars that looked like quarters uh, came out, and a lot that got a lot of people in trouble because. You were trying to tell the customer that this is a dollar, and they said, "No, it's a quarter." You know, and so <laughs> yeah. you, you, sometimes you came up short that, and you know, in that uh, aspect so, of it. Yeah, I, I, I can totally relate to that. I, and I, uh, yeah, so you're absolutely right. And that 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 type of process is really good for a company to have. You know, you have a separate person count the drawer, separate person count the bank. You know, having that type of checks and balances is really important. And and I, I understand about being on pins and needles because it's like, well, you don't know if you're over or under, and, you know, what's going to happen from that perspective. So, but yeah, I it's, it's interesting. Yeah. I, I, appreciate, I appreciate you sharing that, that story with us. Okay, so are, are there any comments, questions, concerns uh, before we call it a night? Is everyone is okay? I'm good, Professor. Thank you. Okay, great. Wonderful. Okay, okay, y'all. So, so let's call it a class. And um, if you think of anything, you run into any trouble or or whatever it is, you just go ahead and send me an email or schedule office hours with me, and I'll be happy to help you out. Okay, thank you, Professor. Y'all have a great evening. Thank you. Take care. Good night. You too. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night. All right. Good night. Good night. Good night, Bertie. Take care. Good night. Good night, Tony. Always a pleasure to have you.